are back on the Zero Hour. This is your host, Richard R.J. Escal. After the 2016 election in particular, everybody was trying to figure out how states like Nebraska became Republican strongholds. I especially wanted to know the answer to that because I had spent some time in the Midwest, including Nebraska. All the people I met there were extremely nice and I uh, really enjoyed the places and the people. Um, and there was a disconnect between the kind of demonization we would experience, uh, let's say, from liberal talk shows or whatever, the people themselves. So my next guest, who is from the great state of Nebraska, has actually written a book about that. Ross Benish is the author of several books, uh, including, uh, believe it or not, Sex Weirdopedia, which was, and The Sex Effect, which won a Nebraska Book Award and was described as Freakonomics without pants. And I will tell my guests that I interviewed the Freakonomics guy. I never want to see him without pants. Uh, <laughs> but he, he's written for a number of outlets. You know a lot of them, American Prospect, Entertainment Weekly, Esquire, The Nation, Rolling Stone, New York, etc., Slate, Vice. And he has a new book out entitled um, Rural Rebellion, How Nebraska became a Republican stronghold. The author is Ross, again, is Ross Benish, B-E-N-E-S, and he joins us now. So first of all, Ross, thanks for coming on the program. Oh, thanks for having me on, Richard, and I enjoy that you referenced the Freakonomics guy being pantsless. This is really an image that now, having been implanted in my brain, <laughs> I will never be able to offload, I don't think. Um, so let's start with this. You've obviously, you know, written for a number of publications, written for, uh, uh, you know, on a number of topics. Uh, I guess where I, normally uh, a place I often start with authors is what inspired you to write this book. But you actually say in the book, which is what inspired you, I think if you're being serious, which is you got sick of people asking you uh, what happened to Nebraska and uh, why is the politics like that so you decided to write the book uh, perhaps tongue-in-cheek you're expressing it but uh just so that you didn't have to uh answer the question when are you going to write about nebraska yeah you know uh, larry david mentioned something similar when he brought back curb people he's like why did you do it and he's like people just kept asking me so i just did it um but seriously though that was a big influence was after trump got elected just continually being asked how can people vote for him? What's it like in your home state? And you know, having enough of those conversations and people being interested of just saying, okay, well, I'm just gonna write a book about it, have it all in one place and document it and um, be done with it. And you know, have something that people can go to understand this um, that isn't just like, you know, a quick news hit article or something like that. Well, I think it's a real service because I think there's an incredible uh, void of understanding when it comes to uh, rural communities and when it comes to uh, states like Nebraska in what we would call the liberal coastal enclaves, for lack of a better term. And, and so to me, it fills uh, a need. And one of the things that seems to me to be a consistent theme in your book is you know, you don't put it this way, but the way I would put it is enough with the othering, you know, capital O, of the people who live in these states as if they're alien creatures, as if they're deplorable, as if they must be horrible people. They have, and you make this point explicitly, you know, they have different life experiences that have led them to perhaps make different political differences. Those may not be uh, are different political choices. They may not be ones that you or I would have picked, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not worthy of respect as human beings. It doesn't mean they're not nice to live with. That doesn't mean uh, we shouldn't try to understand where they're coming from. I'm obviously paraphrasing you. No, but that, that's that's correct. Um, I, and I, you know, after Trump, there was a lot of coverage on places like that, and there were um, titles like "Meet the Deplorables," and you you had got the sense that. Um, whether it was a book or like a TV feature is like someone going on a safari to go to this place right. and see what it's like. And, and when CNN came to my hometown, they uh, talked to a guy in army fatigues for like half of this segment. You know, I, I don't, I don't know anyone out there who is uh, regularly wearing them, but they found the one guy to uh, portray that way. <laughs> so right. um, th that just kind of drove me nuts 
over time. And um, I wanted to explore a little deeper, like what drove this area to the right? Because in my experience, it isn't a safari. These are good people. There's kind of a paradox there. They're really sweet, genuine people, but they've also embraced some very reactionary right-wing politicians who um, I don't think are doing a service to them. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And I think you, you do a great uh, job of sketching that out in your book, Rural Rebellion. And I'm sorry, but it, it's just hard to say fast. Yeah. No, it's I, like it's that uh, 30 Rock thing of rural juror, that yep. running joke of the show that nobody could pronounce. But but <laughs> you do a great job of uh, of explaining you know, how their values get translated into this. But I think one of the things that people would find interesting is and you know thomas frank who's on this show pretty regularly has written what's the matter with kansas but he's written the history of agrarian populism as have others is that you know you guys you had uh what was his name morris the politician who was pretty radical in his day i believe he was governor of oh you're talking about george norris norris yeah i'm sorry yeah, oh, he's a u.s senator U.S. Senator, you yep. have the fact that you have a unicameral legislature there that is not organized by party, which I think was a really interesting idea at the time. So it's not as if, you know, a lot of people on the coasts, I think, assume that this is just like bred into the genes of, uh, you know, over many generations. But as you point out, even under, you know, George H.W. Bush, not so long ago, uh, you know, they were more like uh, Doug Jones Democrats than they were like, uh, um, you know, extremist right Republicans that they are now. So, you know, what do you think happened? I mean, how did we get from uh, a centrist but reasonable state filled with nice people to uh, extremist right wing state filled with nice people? Well, a huge thing that happened is the churches became more involved politically during the 90s and they really preached about culture wars a lot in their sermons. I experienced this uh, in my parish. We're, we're part of Lincoln Diocese, a Catholic church. And you would hear more about abortion um, over the course of a year than you would like the rest of the world's problems combined. And I think that wears on people who maybe aren't going there for politics, but if you are going there already and you get it preached at you, um, it has an effect. And um, there's you know a synergy there between right-wing churches churches and the Republican Party. And that's had a huge effect. And another thing I, I would say is that um, politics have become so nationalized, whether it's through our media sources or you look at who's donating to campaigns, um, you know, obviously Twitter feeds into this, that it's made um, Democrats seem like they're the party of cities or the party of coasts. Right. And that hasn't resonated well in um, the middle of the country. So, you know, a Democratic candidate when I grew up in the past, in the 90s, could make their own platform. They may stand with Democrats on most issues, but they deviate on certain things so they could appeal to Nebraska voters. And now uh, people, voters are so entrenched on voting on someone whose um, national party they identify with that once they see someone's a Democrat, even if that person has stances that may align with them and not with the Democratic Party, they just uh, you know, push them away. Uh, example of that was Bob Kerry. He was a U.S. senator from Nebraska. He was governor. And then he went to New York for about 10 years and came back to ran uh, for U.S. Senate. And he just got crushed. And some people could say, well, he went to New York. But I mean, man, this was a guy who was really popular in Nebraska. And suddenly just the fact of him being a Democrat made him unelectable. It's a huge huh. change in, you know, course of a little over a decade. And he normally, you know, before that would have been seen as an attractive sort of centrist candidate. Bob Kerry went went to Vietnam, you know, lost a leg doing service. Uh, he founded was a businesses. Successful businessman, yeah, exactly. right? He had, had all those restaurants and everything. So, but yeah, but now just, uh, you know, I I, I really, uh, I got, as I say, I found a lot of interest uh, that was of interest to me in your book, Ross Benish. But, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about this religion part of it a little bit, because I think it's still true that Democrats and the left, by and large, don't know how to communicate to religious people. And I think in the face of this sort of 
onslaught from the pulpit of political partisanship that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years is stuff that I know more. I did have a Catholic grandmother, but I mostly remember being scared of her. Uh, the I, I, I had more close exposure to the sort of evangelical world. And I know in that world, you know, the liberal arguments, well, Jesus loved the poor. And, you know, while all true, they, you know, they've, they, 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 they've developed enormous like kind of rhetorical barriers so that that, well, those aren't foundational texts and these are foundational. Sure. Nobody likes think... cognitive dissonance. Yes, yes, yeah. And uh, so basically every time someone comes in and says, well, you know, Sermon on the Mount, who doesn't know this stuff inside and out, they're just emphasizing the difference, the cultural gap, I think. But, uh, you know, can you imagine in your own mind a way to bridge that? Or is it just that the power of these this... Uh, organizational, uh, you know, onslaught from the church is just going to be tough to resist. Well, what's so tough is, um, especially with Catholic Church, is that the leaders of those, um, you know, parishes or of, of the um, diocese, they're, you know, they're appointed by um, a central figure, you know, in that case, the Pope. So as long as, uh, you know, not so much under Francis, but under like John Paul II, as long right. as the Pope's were, were appointing bishops that were, you know, very, uh, very conservative politically. That's kind of the messaging you're you're going to receive. That it's hard to to resist against that. Uh, evangelicals are, uh, you know, a little less centralized, so there may be a little more room. But um, when the leaders are that way, it, it's very very tough going. Um, I I guess I would just say I wish Democrats were able to make a little bit more inroads with more churches. And help them see how some of the government programs that Democrats sponsor are actually in line of like Jesus's message of helping the poor. I mean, you know, when you think about like COVID response or right. Affordable Care Act, um, but the churches have gone so far in this anti-government um, lens and being with the Republican Party that I don't have great recommendations. All I can say is like, this is the problem. This is how it happened. No, absolutely. Uh, and again, we're talking with Ross Benish, whose uh, new book is Rural Rebellion, How Nebraska Became a Republican Stronghold. And um, along those lines, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that you talk about that fascinates me a lot is the reaction to the Affordable Care Act. And, um, you know, I'm one of those people who thought it didn't go far enough or relied on the private insurers, all that stuff. Um but out there, uh, you know, you describe how people really resented the government, quote unquote, telling them what to do, telling them they had to have this insurance, which, by the way, I understand in the sense that mandating buying it, uh, buying lousy insurance, uh, even with premium assistance, if, if you're lower income, I can see how that would rile people. But I, I'm just curious to know how that contrasts with the way people, uh, the kind of folks you're talking about in Nebraska, uh, think of Social Security or Medicare, which nationally are pretty popular programs and their government insurance. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, when something's built into someone's life over the course of decades, they tend to not think of it as government, even if they support it. So, you know, they're very skeptical of new government programs, but like Nebraska is the only state with a hundred percent public power. All our, all our uh, utilities mm -hmm. are publicly owned. I never once heard people complain when I was growing up. Oh God, we got to get rid of public power. That's socialism. That's, that's big government. Right. It was just, it was just like a way, it was just a fact that they were used to like, oh yeah, uh, you know, we, we publicly own our power. So what, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, social security, not a big deal. They, they get used to it and they, um, become more accepting over time, e even on the Affordable Care Act, which um, cost Ben Nelson his, his career in which Nebraskans uh, fundamentally opposed. These days, there's a lot more support for it. Nebraska passed Medicaid expansion in 2018. Right. So between like 2010 and, and 2020, as people got more used to the ACA being a part of their life, there's still people opposed to it in Nebraska, but not like they were when it was being slogged through. So you got to, I guess, like, get them in the habit and show them like this is good for you and then maybe they'll you know tame down a little bit yeah i mean they have this it, to me it strikes me as as tying into that whole 
psychology of like uh, you know the old western pioneer american you're not the boss of me kind of reaction of like don't, don't tell me what to do you know if it's there already fine you know i'll click cash my social security check i'll get my medicare card but uh if it's new it's like i, I don't like the government interfering in my life and it and you see that with covid too yeah well how's the mask situation there i mean how um, a lot of people not happy about it from my uh, anecdotal experience. Now, uh, and again, we're talking with Ross Benish. His book is Rural Rebellion. Now, on a different note, uh, I really enjoyed your portrait of your dad. Um, and you write, uh, my dad is essentially Hank Hill. Uh, and for that's King of the Hill, the, uh, the, the uh, program, the animated program. <laughs> for some reason, I mean, this is just me, but I love that without fail, if they don't have his favorite Bud Light, he he will remark, this ain't Bud Light after taking the first sip. I could just picture that. So how did he... Many restaurants. Uh, what's that? that? I've been to many restaurants and baseball games having to had that experience. And you hear that? This ain't Bud Light. It's amazing how, how predictable like our, our dads can be. Yeah. Uh, the um, My dad had his own liquor things too but but um how what did you what did he think of the book what did your family think of the book well i don't think my dad's read it and i don't really expect him to read it i i think the last time he read a book was a book that coach tom osborne put out uh so he read the newspaper but a, a politics book even if his son put it out uh, yeah my, my mom has read most of it and she seems to have liked it um she didn't think that the churches were as politically involved as i made them out to be but i think she's a little a culture to that situation having yeah. played organ in the church for for 40 years um but um they didn't hate it which was refreshing and um <laughs> you know my, my parents though um you know they, they don't listen to fox they don't um uh tune into talk radio too much uh they uh listen to npr but um they uh actually voted for biden this last election Did which they? yeah surprised me they, they um so they're very conservative but um i also think they're 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 pretty reasonable and they haven't um you know been taken over by this far right mania so uh and they feel okay about you being a writer and they made their peace with it it, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't something that they liked initially especially when i start out with two sex books but um yeah, well, I imagine this was a relief for them, yeah, probably. Maybe that's why my mom didn't hate it so much, because it wasn't <laughs> a, a book that's talking about sex for once. Now, your hometown is Brainerd, right? Yep. So you say in Brainerd, Nebraska, there are no stoplights, movie theaters, grocery stores, parking meters. It goes on and on. Concert halls, rec centers, car dealerships, public gyms, convenience stores, or chain restaurants. Uh, so, you know, the fact is, as you know, Ross, uh, as less and less of the American population lives in places like that now compared to before. Uh, I can't remember when, I think at the turn of the 20th century, we were 80% agrarian or something. And now uh, that's more well more than flipped. But, but people in those kinds of communities are really important politically because of the way our electoral college works and the way our Senate works. Um, and I think one of the points you make too is that, um, and by the way, your, even though I grew up in the Rust Belt, your neighborhood is like mine in one respect. You'd be under the impression that you write that Lutherans and Methodists are ethnic minorities since nearly everyone in, attends the same Catholic church. That was true where I grew up too. And when my mom told me the Catholics were a minority in the world, I was shocked. <laughs> I was wait, but the Ferones, the, you know, the McCarthy's, everybody's the, um, uh, but one of the things you talk about a lot is, well, not a lot, but you do reference it is, uh, the resentment at either being labeled deplorables or thought of as, I mean, this is basically a group of people who feels that the Democratic Party, as I, t as I take it, isn't interested in them, doesn't care about them, uh, doesn't see... Uh, thinks they're racist, thinks they're stupid, you know, all these things. Right. I mean, you know, Stan Greenberg, the pollster, uh, did a, a in-depth focus groups in... in um, uh, 
I always mispronounce the name of the county, Macomb County in uh, Michigan that went for Trump and uh, not 100 percent different demographically from where you're from. And, uh, you know, they seemed more open to what we would think of as like highly progressive ideas when they were expressed in a certain way. And these were Trump voters by and large and so on. But they were very open to, for example, you know, we got to do something about the environment. If you didn't say Green New Deal, but you said we got to do something to fix the environment, we got to put people back to work, we got to, you know, if you express things that we got to fix our crumbling bridges and all that, people were open to it. Do you think the same is true in Nebraska or do you think it's just uh, that's all government stuff? No, I think they're open to it as long as it's expressed um, without it being attached to the Democrats. They, they've become so opposed to, to Democrats. But when some of those ideas are put through like a ballot initiative, Nebraskans will pass them. I already mentioned uh, Medicaid, um, which was, you know, um, put through as uh, addressing the gap instead of being the Affordable Care Act. Uh, minimum wage increase happened uh, about eight years ago. And they just capped uh, interest rates on payday loan companies. Now, if a Democratic um, candidate would have ran on those issues, I don't think they would have had as much success. And the Republicans would have attacked them and they would have attacked that candidate. And then that issue would have had a face that they could attack. But when it was just like an issue on a paragraph, in a, you know, a paragraph or two on a ballot, they had more success. And I think they'll have success with, um, you know, maybe medical marijuana in the future or, or redistricting reform. Um, maybe some broadband expansion. There are these things that um, when it's put through without labels, people there tend to be more supportive than um, I think people give them credit for. One of the, uh, that sort of confirms my suspicion. So thanks for that. One of the things you write after talking about, you know, some of your, some of the history of Nebraska populism and so on, is you write the state that used to make life hell for moneyed interests now nails itself to the cross of gold, that being a reference to William Jennings Bryan and his famous cross, cross of gold speech, you know, populist presidential candidate. Um, so do people, you think, have any sense that they're being, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but is it any sense that they're being manipulated by moneyed interests here? Or do they just think that, are they not making the connection? You have a governor from a family worth billions, and now he's remaking the party in his own far right image. And it seems to me a lot of, from what you write, that a lot of dark money is behind that. Do you think people have any sense that they're being played by big money in some of this stuff? Well, I, I do think people there want to reduce the money in politics, and they do think there's too much money, even though you know they elect this this billionaire uh, or this governor from a family worth billions. Um, but uh, I, I just think they've become so um, I don't want to say enamored, but they've become so like they cling to the Republican Party, uh, and, and they love to um, push back against anything Democrats are trying to do. That it's like that's become. Um, like a political habit for them. You know, th- there's a lot of things um, our, our governor did that would have disqualified him from years past. His biggest donor, his father, um, lives in Wyoming because he doesn't want to pay state income taxes, even though he made his billions uh, through a company he founded in Omaha. I mean, that would have been a scandal in the past. And now it just kind of brushed aside because this guy claims to be culturally conservative and, uh, you know, will uh, oppose a, a, a liberal agenda. Um, and um, that's what's seemed to resonate with them. What's you, you point out in your book that the Democratic registration was down from something like 42 percent when you were born to something like 29 percent now. Pretty steep drop. What's uh, if, you, if it was in the book, I didn't retain it. And uh, what is voter participation like these days? Are people do people get out and vote? Do they not? They, they do get out and vote. But the, this is another reason why the rural areas have a disproportionate influence is the rural areas are older and wider and more likely to be Republican. And they uh, turn out at much higher rates than the people in the city. So even though uh, most Nebraska residents live in um, like the Omaha Lincoln area, like our two largest cities, the rural people have a huge influence. The Democrats have actually won st- statewide for Senate and governor recently in our two largest cities, but they'll lose statewide by like 15 percentage points because they're just getting slaughtered 
in those rural areas where the, where the turnout is really high in the rural areas. If you had to design like from scratch uh, um, the ideal candidate, Democratic candidate for uh, for especially rural Nebraska, what we, and you could program in everything, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> hair color, eye yeah. color, whatever it is, you know, a personality type, a biography. Uh, what would that uh, candidate look like? I think Connor Lamb is a decent proxy. Uh, if I had to choose like someone who's out there right now, someone like him, but probably even further to the right, especially on like uh, abortion issues. And Democrats would not like that nationally, but right. that's the best you're going to do. I remember when um, Ben Nelson was in office and he would vote conservatively on some stuff and people would get pissed off about him. And I, I you know, have to remind them out here that like, well, the alternative to Ben Nelson isn't a Democrat further to the left. It's a Republican. You know, this is Nebraska you're talking about. So um, a slightly more conservative Connor Lamb, I, I think, would have be the best chance in that state. Well, what's interesting about Connor Lamb, and again, you know, sort of seen as a centrist, uh, now member of Congress from a rural Pennsylvania or semi-rural Pennsylvania, uh, is that while he's right-leaning for a Democrat on a lot of issues, he was out there strong for labor and for social security and a couple of things that didn't clash with that at all, uh, which to me is interesting uh, and makes him an interesting case study. Um, I also wonder to what extent, um, well, let me let me actually take a, a, a slightly different angle. You, you yourself had, you, you describe in the book, you had some health conditions yep. that maybe, you know, uh, increased your support for the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, I have some health conditions too. And sometimes I feel guilty about uh, how much money I'm costing the government. And then somebody says, no, you're worth it. And I think, okay, and I forget <laughs> it for a few weeks. But, you know, it is a big deal, right? I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's literally, it's people literally having to decide sometimes, you know, do they lose their vision or do they pay the rent? You know, the trade-offs are so drastic, and in other countries, people don't have to make them like that. Yeah, I mean, I always think of that teacher, uh, I think she, um, if I recall correctly, Texas, Oklahoma, I think, who, Tulsa, who, uh, you know, she got her, her antibiotic for her flu was $116. She was like, I can't really step up to that right now, and it killed her. You know, I mean, it's obviously she couldn't know that would happen but we're forced to make these choices do you think the people you grew up with and brainerd uh, and the people of nebraska do you think enough stories like that would make a difference i mean they, they have become more supportive a little bit of government health care but they there's still a long ways to go the, the story would have to happen to someone they know when it's something like a teacher from oklahoma i don't think it sways them but if it's like their father or, you know, right. or their friend, that may. And, um, you know, with COVID, a lot of people are going to have pre-existing conditions now. I mean, millions right. more than what had before. So we don't know the long-term effects of this. So figuring that out is, is, I mean, it's more crucial now than probably ever before. At least in my now, time. Where you, right now you're in New York City again, right? Yep. So have you been back to Nebraska since the uh, pandemic got bad? No, um, because of my health conditions. I just yeah. got my second shot and I'm um, I'm going out there in about a month. Um, it's been too long since I've seen people. Um, but I, I, I've pretty much refrained from air travel, um, you know, once this got bad, since I have autoimmune problems already. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I know how that feels. And having gotten my second shot almost a month ago now, man, what a relief not to have to worry about surviving, right? I think you're probably going through that now too. Just that constant drone, you don't even realize the constant background stress of, will I catch it? If so, will I survive it? Nice to put that behind us and I hope more people can soon. So I, I, I hope you do go back. And um, I guess, uh, you know, just in terms of wrapping all this up, uh, you know, your book, to me, Rural Rebellion, is not so much, a pre it's really not a prescription, right? It's really just a description yeah. of 
of the way things are, and that's good because that's you know that's where these that's where change starts. Um, but I guess if you could say one, if you had one message you could give to progressives, liberals uh, who have never been to that part of the world, or um, you know perhaps have never had like a checkout clerk at a supermarket offer to carry your bags to the car. You know, I mean, there are these little pluses that people don't, in my per, have experience. Yeah, no, there are. You know what I mean? That make, that, that count for a lot, actually. And um, civility, kindness, and all that. Um, the, if you could say one thing to those folks, what would it be? It'd be that there's a beautiful sense of community in small towns with, with neighbors depending on each other and helping one another out. And, um, you know, if we just define these people by how they choose politicians on a ballot, we're really missing the essence of their humanity. So, you know, I, I wanted to empathize a lot with the people I grew up with because I, I think there's a lot of beauty there, even though I chose to leave it and, and I prefer life in cities. Um, I don't think we should forget about them or write them off. Do they kid you when you go back home? Do you get teased about being the New York? Oh yeah. yeah. All right, but you can handle it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. All right. I, I've been called worse things. Oh, I can imagine, haven't we all? But um, again, uh, Ross Ross Benish is my guest. His book, uh, which I recommend, is "Rural Rebellion: How Nebraska Became a Republican." stronghold so ross thanks for writing it and thanks for coming on the program thanks for having me on here enjoyed it and we'll be right back after this i am richard rj escow and this is the zero hour